Hi there. My name's Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in previous lectures of guitar amplification and effects, we looked at using triodes as preamplifier stages, where the goal was to have voltage gain. In this lecture, we're going to start looking at power amplifiers, where the goal is to actually drive a speaker. In particular, we're going to start looking at the simplest of these, namely single-ended designs, and we'll look at more complicated push-pull structures in later lectures. As our case study, we'll use a cheesy little lamp with a sign on the front said Fender Champ. Anyway, this is one of many Fender Champ designs, but this one is particularly classic. We have the power supply down here, along with the two-prong plug with no ground pin and the death capacitor. You can tell it's one of the earlier designs because it uses a tube rectifier. It's a little hard to read because the main plate voltage supply for the tubes is drawn down here instead of up here where we usually draw it. Anyway, it contains two preamp stages. So the two stages are identical, except for the fact that the first stage is fully bypassed, whereas the second stage is not bypassed at all. They're coupled through this coupling capacitor, and the volume pot for this particular amp is actually between the preamplifier stages. So the load resistors for the preamp stages are drawn here. In this lecture and the next couple of lectures, we're going to explore the power amplifier, which is this mess right here. So the power amplifier's job is to drive the speaker through this transformer. And this transformer is something we need in tube amps that you don't really need in transistor amps. The speaker we're going to consider has a 4 ohm impedance whereas the tube wants to see a much higher impedance. So this transformer converts this 4 ohm impedance into what I'm going to call an 8.2K, you could say 8K impedance. Beyond the tubes, this output transformer is one of the main reasons for the cost and weight of a tube amplifier compared with a transistor amplifier. Now these triodes are things we've looked at a lot, but this beam tetrode, which is functionally equivalent to a pentode, is something new. This is something we just started to look at last lecture. So to review what the beam tetrode is a little bit, remember that there were two kinds I discussed. This design uses a 6V6, which is the less powerful version. More beefy Fender amps would use something like a 6L6. So remember that the beam tetrodes and pentodes introduced a new screen called the screen grid, compared with the control grid that triodes also have. And these beam tetrodes also have beam forming plates. These are equivalent to the suppressor grid in a pentode. The screen grid is generally held at a lesser or equal voltage than the plate. And something that makes our analysis more complicated is that we can't assume that the plate current and the cathode current are the same anymore because under normal operation, although there's no current flowing through the grid, there is going to be a small current flowing through the screen. So the total cathode current is that plate current plus the screen current. So zooming in on the power amplifier, we see that the output of the second preamp stage is coupled to the power amplifier grid via a 0.02 microfarad coupling capacitor. The 220K here is our grid leak resistor that we usually call RG. And we have a cathode resistance of 470 ohms. That's part of the biasing. But that is completely bypassed by this 25 microfarad capacitor. Now, there's also a bit of feedback coming from the secondary of the transformer all the way back to the cathode of the second preamp stage through this 22K resistor. That's not always present in amplifiers, but it is used a lot. But that's something pretty complicated. So as far as today goes, we're not going to talk about that. We'll talk about that in a future lecture. So this is a common cathode amplifier, but the plate load resistor RL that we saw in previous lectures for voltage preamplifier stages is replaced by the primary of the transformer. So the plate power supply is 305 volts. 
And notice that in this particular design, the screen is held at the same voltage as the plate, this 305 volts, but that's not always the case in every design. I've redrawn this power amplifier schematic in a more generic form with the transformer up here with the power supply up here, which makes it a little easier to read, I think, for a modern audience. Again, for this particular amplifier, the power supply for the plate is used for the screen. Some other designs will have a resistor here, which means that the voltage on the plate is a little lower, but this fits the Fender Champ, so we'll go with it. Writing in the specific values for the Fender Champ, I'm using this U here to represent micro, and I'm putting the mu in the middle here to represent where the dot goes. So this is 0 0.02 microfarads. I'm using an R here to represent ohms. So we have a 220K grid leak resistor, 470 ohm cathode resistance, 25 microfarad cathode capacitance, and the coupling capacitance is 0 0.02 microfarad. And from the schematic, this power supply is 305 volts. Now, before I actually get into the biasing, which is the main topic of today's lecture, let me talk a little bit about the effect of these various capacitors on the frequency response. Now, to properly deal with this capacitor, I would have to talk about the output impedance of the previous stage, like we've looked at in a previous lecture. But for the sake of doing a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation to get a feel for things, let's assume that this voltage source that represents that second preamp stage is perfect. If we did that, well, this just forms an RC filter because under usual operating conditions, there's no current flowing through the grid. And if we compute the frequency associated with that filter, I'm using FPC here to represent the pole of this low-pass filter and C to represent the fact that it's coming from the coupling capacitor. If we plug these values into 1 over 2 pi, yada, yada, usual formula, we wind up with 36 hertz. Remember, the lowest note on an electric guitar in standard tuning is 82 hertz, so we don't really need to worry about this too much from a musical standpoint. In a previous lecture, we saw that cathode capacitors had a high-pass effect on preamplifier stages. The same logic applies to power amplifiers. Now, I don't want to even think about computing the pole frequency for this, but it's relatively easy to compute the zero frequency. So I'm going to compute FZK, where Z stands for zero, and K represents the fact that this is a frequency associated with the cathode circuitry. And if we plug in the numbers here, we wind up with something really low. We wind up with 13.5 hertz. So we definitely don't need to worry about that from a musical standpoint. Going back to the original schematic for a second, notice that somebody conveniently wrote 19 volts here at the cathode. So our cathode to ground voltage is 19 volts. Now, in previous lectures, I've usually said things like, let's pretend we didn't see this, and we'll try to compute that on our own, and then we'll draw a load line and a grid line and intersect them, and then we'll get a number and then compare that number against what was written on the schematic. The main problem is that the addition of the screen complicates those kinds of operations so much that I found it very difficult to figure out what this number is from scratch. It's usually involved a lot of trial and error, and I don't want to subject my students to that kind of pain. So we're going to cheat a little bit and just take that 19 volts written on the schematic and then compute other bias quantities based on that. All right, so given this 19 volts, let's take a look at how much power needs to be dissipated by this resistor. So the cathode resistor is going to dissipate 19 squared volts divided by 470 ohms, and that's going to equal 768 milliwatts from that bias current. So if you are used to quarter watt resistors in your Arduino projects or your guitar pedal projects, those quarter watt resistors aren't going to cut it here. So you're going to need at least a one watt resistor. And in my notes from this class, the last time I taught it in 2019, I wrote 
two watts recommended. That doesn't sound like something I came up with. I probably read that somewhere and I don't remember where, but I would probably trust that two watt advice from wherever I got it. So the plate to cathode voltage is just 305 volts minus 19 volts, which gives us 286 volts. Similarly, the screen to cathode voltage is 286 volts, but I want to emphasize that's only for this particular design. In some other designs, this number will be lower. So the grid to cathode voltage is going to be just minus 19 volts, and the bias current is just 19 volts divided by 470 ohms by Ohm's law, giving us 40 milliamps. Now that's the current flowing through the cathode. We would like to know the amount of current flowing through the plate and the amount of current flowing through the screen. And we know that the amount of current flowing through the plate is not the same as what's flowing through the cathode because there is some current flowing through the screen. So to figure that out, we have to do some guessing based on the information available on the data sheets. So sometimes I'll get different data sheets from different manufacturers for the same device because the different manufacturers will provide different kinds of information. This is from the 6V6 data sheet from General Electric. I'm picking the Class A amplifier category. This refers to the kind of single-ended design that we're looking at. The lines we want to look at here are the zero signal plate current and the zero signal screen current. Notice that the data sheet only gives numbers for certain sets of hypothetical conditions. Given these numbers, we can compute ratios of plate currents to screen currents, such as 9.6, 10, and 15 for the left, middle, and right columns. Now, in our particular case, we have a plate to cathode voltage of 286 volts. The closest thing we have here is 250 volts. So I'm going to use this IP over IS value of 10 in some of my calculations, but I'll come back to this point and fudge things a little bit later. So normally I would write a comma Q here and a comma Q here, but that gets a little tedious, so I'm going to suppress that kind of notation on the slide. Anyway, using that middle column number of IP over IS equals 10, I could say, well, the cathode current is equal to the plate current plus the screen current, and remember, these are all the quiescent current values. They're all comma Q kind of quantities. Well, let's take IS and write it as IP divided by 10. Okay, well, I can factor out the IP. I'll write this as 1 plus 1 over 10. So I can say that the cathode current is equal to 1.1 times the plate current. All right. Well, I can now figure out what the plate current is by taking the cathode current and dividing it by this 1.1 factor. Well, the cathode current we computed previously was 40 milliamps. So dividing that by 1.1, we come up with 36.4 milliamps. Now, here's where I did a bit of fudging. Remember that this was computed for 250 volts, but the actual plate to cathode voltage is closer to 286 volts. And notice that this factor goes up with the plate to cathode voltage. Sort of, it's hard to say because notice they also changed the screen voltage here, but I think this is going to be the dominant effect. Yes, I am hand waving. Anyway, supposing that this number was actually a little bit bigger, well, this number here would be a little bit smaller. So this number would be a little bit bigger. So I thought, well, maybe this is maybe something closer to 36.5. I'm just completely pulling that out of a hat. And if it was something like that, I might round it up to something like 37. So that's just a guess. And then 40 milliamps minus 37 would give me the screen current of three milliamps. And I'm going to use these numbers in the remaining calculations. And the main reason I wanted to go through all the effort to justify that fudging was that Richard Cornell uses a figure of 37 milliamps for the plate bias current in his excellent webpage that analyzes the Fender Champ. And I wanted to stay consistent with his work.
As a sanity check, let's examine a new kind of graph we haven't seen before. The grid to cathode voltage is plotted on the horizontal axis, and if I just say grid with no modifier, I mean the control grid, the standard grid we've used all semester. And the current going through the screen grid, IS, that's plotted on the vertical axis for a variety of screen to cathode voltages. So there isn't a specific line associated with 286 volts for the screen to cathode voltage. But if we were to plot minus 19 volts for our grid to cathode voltage and 3 milliamps for our screen current, we could imagine that there's some sort of curve here. And if you look at the way these are spaced, you could imagine, oh, that could be associated with 286 volts. But there is a caveat that this is for a plate to cathode voltage of 250 volts, and this all will slide around a little bit as this plate to cathode voltage changes. We're just getting things in the ballpark. While we're at it, let's make sure these bias values don't blow up our tube. If I multiply the plate to cathode voltage 286 volts by the plate current 37 milliamps, I get a plate dissipation of 10.6 watts. And let's see, checking out the data sheet, we have a maximum plate dissipation of 12 watts in this class A single-ended amplifier mode. So that 10.6 watts is less than that 12 watt limit. Now, although we never saw pre-amplifier stages where the designers exceeded the plate dissipation of something like a 12AX7, I have seen some power amplifier designs where the designer exceeds this limit. How interesting is that? Okay, so what about the screen dissipation? Well, the screen to cathode voltage in this instance is the same as the plate to cathode voltage, and multiplying it by the screen current, we wind up with 852 milliwatts. And checking out the data sheet, we see a maximum screen dissipation of 2 watts. So we are well within the limit as far as the screen goes. Now, although sometimes on power tubes, pentodes or beam tetrodes, designers will push the plate dissipation limit, they'll never push the limit on screen dissipation. The screen is relatively fragile. So here's a set of plate characteristics, aka output characteristics for the 6V6. Notice something a little unusual that we haven't seen before. This data sheet actually gives us information about what happens when the grid to cathode voltage is positive. So we have these curves here indicating what the plate current is when you have a positive grid to cathode voltage. Now, we don't want to operate in this region. We want to operate in this region where the grid to cathode voltage is negative. That's what these solid lines indicate, the plate current. Now, these dashed lines indicate what the current flowing through the grid is for those positive grid to cathode voltages. But remember, we don't want to be operating in that zone. Now, if we try to plot our various bias parameters on this plot, we get a few inconsistencies, and we'll talk about where that comes from and how to deal with it. So, let's plot that plate to cathode voltage of 286 volts. And if we draw a horizontal line associated with our cathode voltage of 38 millivolts, we wind up intersecting the grid to cathode line associated with minus 15 volts. But we computed a grid to cathode voltage of minus 19 volts, and that minus 19 volt line would be something pretty close to this minus 20 line. So if we imagine something there and then extrapolated left, we get something more like 20 milliamps for our plate current. So there's some inconsistency here, and this is suspect. The main clue is that we have a screen voltage here of 250 volts, but remember our actual screen to cathode voltage is 286 volts. So we need to use some other graphs on the data sheet and extrapolate those a little bit to actually compute some large signal analysis and figure out how many watts of power we're delivering to the speaker.
So we'll talk about that next time.